Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. Today we're continuing my series of giving you advice and tools for analyzing job adverts and contracts for working in commercial archaeology in the UK. If you haven't seen my previous two videos on this topic, then they are linked both here and in the description box below. I really recommend watching all three together to get the full picture of everything I'm talking about. Today's video is going to cover accommodation, training, and benefits. Kind of three things that didn't really fit into the first two videos. First, I'm going to cover what you should be looking for for in all of these three sections. At the end, we're going to take everything I've talked about and apply it to and compare three anonymous entry-level advertisements for archaeologists in the UK, which I've pulled off of the British Archaeological Jobs resource. I have never worked at any of these three companies, and I'm keeping them anonymous in an effort to be unbiased. Before we get started, make sure that you hit that subscribe button and the bell notification to subscribe to my channel and get notified every time I put out new videos. Today's first topic is accommodation. Basically, any time that you are getting requested to go away from home overnight on a job, usually this means you're probably traveling a couple hours away from your home base, you should be getting provided accommodation by the company that's hiring you. This means your employer will find the accommodation, book it, and pay for it, and there should be no expenses on your part for this. One of the big benefits that I have found to working in the UK versus Canada is that in the UK, in general, you can almost guarantee that you will get your own room to sleep in. When I worked in Canada, I actually usually had to share a hotel room with either one or two other people, which is perfectly fine, especially if they are your friends, that which they tend to be, but it also means that you don't really get a lot of your own space. But in the UK, you can pretty much guarantee that you're going to have your own room unless you are working on a project with your romantic partner, which is also quite common because archaeologists tend to date ar other archaeologists. When you start receiving either all of your details of your contract, or you're looking at the advertisement itself, or especially if it's for a specific job, you should be looking to see if the accommodation is quoted as being either catering or self-catering. A catered accommodation means that you will be generally staying probably at like a hotel or a bed and breakfast, and you'll be going out to a restaurant at night to eat because there are no kitchen facilities for you to use. Self-catered is just the complete opposite. That means that you'll probably be staying in like a holiday cottage or let that has a kitchen that you will be able to use. And at the beginning of the week, everybody usually just goes to the grocery store after your first day of work and buys everything that they need for the week and then just cooks for themselves. Or sometimes people pool together and cook for the group. Whether or not your accommodation is catered or self-catered will also have a knock-on impact on how much you receive for your subsistence pay. Generally, you receive more if it's catered because eating out is more expensive and self-catered is obviously less. Knowing whether or not you're staying catered or self-catered on accommodation will also dictate to you what you should actually be packing for staying away from home. If you can, check where exactly you're going to be staying or where your job is, especially if it's gonna be somewhere particularly remote because this means that your options for where you might be staying are quite limited and are really gonna be a throw of the dice as to whether or not they're gonna be good or bad. On one side, you might end up somewhere really nice and I've had quite a few of those experiences staying at these like luxe holiday lets, one of which had like a hot tub which after a day of field work was amazing to be able to go and sit in and because I knew about it in advance was able to bring a bathing suit in order to utilize said hot tub. On the other side of things, you might end up somewhere that's really not so nice, which I have also had quite a few experiences in. The one that always sticks out in my mind to me is when I was staying somewhere up in the northeast of Scotland. The people in the office had booked the accommodation and whatever the advertisement was hadn't given them like the exact location when they were looking for it. So somewhere that they thought they had booked us in a town to stay in was actually like a few miles out of town on a farm and it, while the house itself was like nice enough they had no internet it was next to like a cow shed it was also next to a field of sheep which was a very cute and nice scenery but the cows were very loud especially in the morning we had really like basic cable tv to watch the cutlery and the kitchen equipment were like very bare and left a lot to desi be desired. All of the knives in the accommodation were dull and the thing to kind of top it all off was that they had a coin operated electricity meter. I didn't even know that you could get that kind of stuff in general much less 
like in modern day but we actually ended up having to like go to the bank and have and take out a bunch of money and get pound coins just so we could operate electricity to get like hot water and heating and everything so yeah that was a bit of a crazy experience and definitely a good example of how accommodation can really really vary depending on where you're staying and how limited the options are in the time i've been working in uk archaeology i have seen one or two advertisements where the companies were asking people to camp out on sites which is really really remote personally as somebody who's not really big on camping i would never take a job that is asking me to camp after a long day of digging i want to be on a real mattress with a hot shower i would definitely say that camping adverts are few and far between because i think most companies recognize that one way to attract workers is to offer them decent accommodation next up are general benefits they are not consistent across any companies and what that every each individual company offers will vary they will all as i've said before in previous videos follow the uk law but within that there can be quite a bit of interpretation clothing allowance is something that is very frequently mentioned within a lot of advertisements or on company websites for benefits that they offer if they are required to provide you with the necessary personal protective equipment ppe required for whatever job they are doing but obviously different jobs and projects have different standards for how much ppe you have to be wearing a lot of bigger jobs like infrastructure projects or maybe like big housing developments will nowadays in my experience require you to basically dress like a traffic cone however other smaller projects might only require you to wear a hard hat and a vis vest additionally some companies may give you a clothing allowance when it comes to buying yourself steel-toed boots these are generally something you have to wear on every single construction site. It protects your feet. Some companies might not want to give you money for it because they are obviously something that you are going to take from job to job. But the overall advice I would give for clothing allowances, because there's not going to be tons of detail about it on the advert or on a company's website, is to ask what the clothing allowance is, what you can expect to get, and what you need to provide for yourself. Because nobody wants to show up on their first day of the job thinking, oh, I'm going to get a full set of PPE shirt, trousers, and vis vest, and jacket and boots and find out they're only getting a vis vest and a hard hat that creates a bad impression of you on your first day showing up under equipped for the job because you just assumed they were going to provide everything for you CSCS cards CSCS stands for construction safety certification scheme it is a specific type of card that you need in order to be on site on the majority of UK construction projects nowadays. It is a way of verifying that you've had some very basic safety training. The way that you get it is very similar to some ways that you get driver's licenses. You have a study book, you go to a test center, you fill out a multiple choice test online, you have to pass by a certain percent. And then once you have your results, you can phone in and you can get the card. It is like an ID card, so it has your photo and your name on it. So you can't like trade it between people. In the past, I have said, go and get this yourself, which I have personally done before for work. I have also had work pay for me to get it because it is something that expires and you have to renew. And whatever company you're working for, will have a different policy and sometimes that policy might be flexible if they are requiring it and they've offered you a contract but you're struggling for money they might offer to pay it for it for you they might offer to pay for it now and then you pay them back it's always just worth asking what they expect more and more companies are starting to pay for people to get cscs testing especially for like permanent staff temporary staff is kind of depending on what project you're on and how long you're expecting to be on it also companies if they are going to pay for you to take the test or they regularly have people within the company taking the test they should be able to provide you with study materials for the test it is not a test that you can generally walk into and pass 80 percent of it is common sense and then 20 percent of it can be quite specific so you definitely need to use the study materials in whatever format they come in. There are a couple different levels of CSCS card that you can get. I can go into more detail about it in another video if you guys want, but it's very specific to the UK. You should also be looking to see about CIFA membership fees and whether or not they are paid for by the company that you're looking to work for. Paid CIFA fees might be something that's only restricted to permanent or long-term employees, but it's definitely something to look at if you're wanting to stay at a company or if you're looking for a 
permanent job, it's always helpful to have. Quite a few archaeology companies have started offering their staff like extra private health insurance slash like sick pay. So the UK does have a public health care system. So that means that you pay basically a tax for your insurance on your paycheck, but you can go to the doctor or the hospital anytime and you don't have to pay money for it. It's fantastic. There are some issues though with the amount of time that you have to wait for something or the process that you have to go through in order to get seen for very like specific things. So this is where private health insurance comes in because it allows you to kind of skip the line and still not pay the full amount for private health care. A few archaeology start companies have started offering this extra private health insurance. It does not amount to much in comparison to what you might expect in the US or Canada, but it does mean that you might be able to claim back some costs in relation to dental visits, getting eye health checkups. I know that for me personally, I do have it through my company. I was able to claim back some money for some initial appointments for consulting for my eye surgery that I got. There's also long-term illness or death at work pay that a couple companies are offering. This is not to imply that you are likely to die at work, but these policies generally cover if, say, you find out you have cancer or some kind of other long-term debilitating illness that means that you can't work, it means that you are then covered and paid a certain amount of your wage and money so that you're not absolutely destitute because it's not your fault that you're sick. Additionally, if you happen to die while you're employed, not while you're at work, but while you're employed by this company, your nominated beneficiary will then receive a payout of money so that they are not completely screwed, especially if they are depending on you for your income. These two things are not really things that I think most entry-level employees are thinking about but definitely are things that you care more about the long the older you get and the longer term more permanent your work is the last topic we're going to cover today is training and or continued professional development training is something that i personally have noticed a real uptick in being mentioned on advertisements for archaeological jobs advertisements say oh we offer training for this person and you're going to get dedicated training for this and you're going to get cultivated for that blah 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 and that's great because for a long time there has been a big argument between universities and employers about who is responsible for training people to do their jobs. And obviously each side of the argument is trying to argue that the other person is responsible because training people costs money. There's also another sub layer of context here in that it's really discouraging for a lot of newcomers to archaeology to just start a job and get dropped in the deep end and ex and there's an expectation that they already know what they're doing and so don't have as many people entering archaeology as you might want. Companies have now started recognizing that this is not helpful for them being able to retain staff and so there has been a general initiative within the sector to provide training and place it on the forefront of things that they are developing for their staff. So like I said, this is something you're going to see in a lot of advertisements nowadays and people are going to be talking all about how fabulous it is. As with anything, you need to take it with a grain of salt. Just because they talk about training and how they're going to train you and whatever, that does not mean that that is actually what's going to happen and you definitely need to be out on the lookout for companies that are just basically paying lip service to this. Ways to suss this out, whether or not it's genuine or not, is to contact companies and ask them about the training program. What kind of training are they going to offer you specifically? How are they going to measure whether or not you have actually absorbed that training or you need a little bit more time to get familiar with? How does the training scheme work? How long is it expected to take you? How long these programs are or how long they kind of expect someone to be a trainee for before they move up and become a site assistant is really, really important because I know people who have been caught in a trap where they got hired as a trainee, which means that they can pay you less and they weren't given any measurable goals. They weren't given any like official training. They were maybe told to like hang around these people and those people would show them what to do. And so they weren't really treated any differently than us or given any special extra attention to make sure that they were getting actual training. And they were kept on that program for a prolonged period of time and the goalposts for how they were supposed to progress would change. And I know this is not something that's happened to only one person. In general, I would say that if a company is expecting you to 
operate at a trainee level for more than six months, probably wouldn't advise working for them. With six months of experience in archaeology, you would be able to leave that job and go find a site assistant position pretty much anywhere else in the UK. It shouldn't only be complete newbies that are receiving training in archaeology. Training is something that should be continued throughout your whole career and in general once you move past being a trainee this generally tends to get called continued professional development aka CPD. The idea behind CPD is that it encourages you to continue to learn and develop your career throughout the lifetime of it rather than just reaching a certain point and being like, all right, I don't need to learn anymore. Generally, CPD is something that is measured and looked at through an annual review process. At a lot of companies, they sit down and they say, what have you done in the last year that contributes towards your professional development? What are your goals and things that you want to learn for the next year, etc.? If you are a member of CIFA, you also have to actually submit a CPD form that shows that you've completed 50 hours of CPD every two years. Ways that companies might support you in your CPD are by having budgets to go to either internal or external lectures, going to conferences, although you will probably have to argue why it's relevant for you to go to that conference. It can't just be, I feel like having a couple paid days to go to this thing. Going to any workshops, going to particular training sessions or training courses. CPD is not limited to those things. Things like reading a particular book on a subject related to archaeology or what particularly your job is will count. So it's quite flexible. Anytime that you do something related to CPD, you should be keeping track of it in some way. Some companies will have their own system for tracking CPD, some companies will use the Badger Skill Passport, but if you don't have any of those things, just keeping track of the time, date, topic, and how long you spent doing it, and, and maybe just like some general points of what you actually learned will usually be enough. Also, if you receive any kind of certificates for any kind of training that you've received, that's a good way to prove that you've done some CPD as well. All right, so that's everything that you should be looking for. Now we're gonna take it and apply some of these things to looking at the three jo job adverts that I've pulled off of Badger. The first company has quite a few of the things that I've talked about as they provide paid accommodation and subsistence for when you're working away from home. They have a training budget and time allotted for people to go to conferences. They have a job matrix to allow people to track and progress in their career. So a set system for people being able to get promoted and move on. They have employee assistance programs, including occupational health, great. Archaeology tends to burn out your body after a while, so anyone that gives you a bit of extra money for maybe getting a massage or physiotherapy is fabulous. They also specifically mention supporting staff who want to do research, which is quite cool. This particular company does quite a bit of community archaeology, and this means that if you join the company and maybe you just join as a site assistant and you progress, and you perhaps have a research project that's relevant to the company that you want to pursue, they might help you with doing that. They pay subscriptions for CIFA for their staff. However, this particular advert also requires people to have a CSCS card before they apply. So this is not a trainee type job and they are expecting you to have that card. I would say that that might be something that is flexible depending on how desperate they are for staff. Also, if you are in the process of getting your CSCS card, that might also be acceptable. So if you don't have it, definitely check with them about whether or not they can be flexible about it. Company number two does also have paid accommodation and subs, fantastic. They pay CIFA fees for their staff. They have a private health insurance program for employees. They have critical illness cover and a life insurance policy. It also interestingly mentions giving you a mobile phone with a plan for personal use, which I'd have to question a little bit. I have a work phone and I've been provided a work phone by several people that I've worked for, which is great, but I use it for work. I don't use it in my off time. And I would also question whether or not they are providing that to every single person at the company, or if it's just for people at a certain level, like site supervisors, project officers, etc. I don't think that they'd be handing out a personal mobile phone to every new person that joins the company on a temporary contract. They also mentioned having service awards, travel loans for staff, and a recruitment bounty scheme, which is not something that is 
unheard of in archaeology. This company in particular is actually an archaeological like department of a larger contracting like engineering and environmental whatever firm. So that's quite common for a business of that size which would basically mean that if you get hired and then you recommend someone else for a job and they get hired and they stay for a particular amount of time you receive money for it. They also mention having funded internal and external training, a certain amount of days set aside every single year for employees to spend on their training as well as a fund for sponsoring you to go get an extra academic qualification so maybe this is like an extra diploma maybe they'll help you get a master's degree if it's relevant to work etc. They also provide development courses around things besides archaeology like management, commercial awareness, business development, and personal development which are all things that I think a lot of archaeologists sometimes tend to overlook as being essential but are definitely a critical part if you want to progress to the point where you're helping run a business or perhaps if eventually you want to start your own business. The third company mentions providing accommodation for away work wherever possible. The wording of that kind of makes me question what exactly they mean by it. I'm sure that they do provide accommodation, but where are they working that implies that you might they might not be able to provide paid accommodation? Generally in the UK, I don't think you're ever too far away from somewhere that you can stay overnight, but I could be wrong. This company only pays half of the CIFA fees for their staff. And their website says that they assist with the costs of CIFA and the CSCS card. So this implies to me that they don't pay for the whole thing and you'll be expected to shoulder some of that yourself. This is the smallest of the three companies that we've looked at, so that's not entirely surprising. But I would recommend trying to work for someone who is going to pay for all of those things if they are a required part of doing your job. This company also has a mix of internal and external training on a variety of topics relevant to archaeology and kind of the construction industry. They have the highest allotment of training days for staff per year, but I would question with how many of those apply for lower level contract staff than upper level permanent staff. All right, that's it. And that's the end of this series. I hope that this advice and tools that I've given you, you can take away and use them to apply for an absolutely stellar job at an employer that you really enjoy working for. In addition to helping better prepare anybody who's thinking of an archaeological career and is wondering what kinds of things they should be looking for in an employer or a job contract. As per usual, my social media is below if you'd like to follow me. The previous videos in this series are linked below. If you have any comments, questions, concerns, please put them in the comment section down below and I'll do my best to answer them. If if you like this video give me a thumbs up and if you'd like to see more from me and help support my channel please give me a subscribe and hit the bell notification thanks so much for watching everyone i'll see you next time bye